and there is the official entrance to Turkey. So there we go, the Turkish flag. I can't believe that I'm here. So surreal. <laughs> Thousands of kilometers of blood, sweat, tears, and pedaling through eight countries, and I was finally on Asia's doorstep. I'd lost track of the number of times I'd questioned whether I'd even make it this far. So cycling across the border from Bulgaria was a massive milestone. And from day one, Turkey had me hooked. Leaving the EU behind, I felt like I'd taken another big step away from home. As I turned to the east and inched ever further from everyone, and everything I knew. Nothing will make you appreciate being alive quite like a hair-raising nine-hour cycle into Istanbul. This is completely crazy. Oh, Jesus Christ. I felt extremely small as I dosed the traffic. Out of 15.5 million people, I'm pretty sure I was the only person cycling into the center that day. This is completely insane. Uh, oh my god, there's so many cars, it is so crowded, it's taken me about five, oh my god. But aside from the nerve-wracking driving, I'd never been in a city that felt so alive, and so brimming with chaotic energy. Turkey's cultural capital was so vast and sprawling that I struggled to wrap my head around its sheer scale and how many people funneled through it each day. I was mesmerized and it was three weeks before I managed to pull myself away. But beyond this city, in the country as a whole, there was something about the hospitality here. I'd never felt so consistently welcomed by total strangers. Often, I was treated like a long-lost friend or relative and invited into countless flats, farms and houses for chai, that's Turkish tea, a hot meal or a bed for the night. This looks fantastic. So it looks like I'm getting a ride. <laughs> Eyvallah! All this stuff is in the back, in that trailer there. <laughs> and I feel like I'm about to fall off. Hi there. <laughs> this is so bumpy. We just picked up a hitchhiker along the way. <laughs> 
so it's becoming a bit of a party now. It was the most at home I'd felt on my cycle from Norway to Azerbaijan, and I reveled in every opportunity I got to interact with local people. Hey, Rala! Gele, gele. <laughs> Luckily for me, one of the most important periods of the year was coming up. And no, it wasn't the fact that it was election season, although it was hard to miss the election buses that seemed to follow you everywhere. It's following us. <laughs> the mayor's election bus. It was the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. And that meant it was Ramadan. And if there was ever a religious holiday that embodied the spirit of hospitality, Ramadan would be it. The holy month lasts 29 to 30 days. And those who take part in it fast for each of those, not eating or drinking anything from a few hours before sunrise until sunset. Back in Istanbul, Mert, a software engineer and pilot in training, had explained the meaning behind Ramadan. According to the Quran, yeah. according to the Holy Quran, Oruç means fasting, yeah. uh, makes your body and your soul more and more stronger. As a philosophy, you can understand the importance of this food, you know, how much you need it. For so sure, a bit about appreciation, appreciating yeah. the... Appreciating the foods, uh, appreciating the meaning of life. The fasting period is dependent on the length of the day, so you have to do it for much longer when Ramadan falls in summer months than when it's in winter. It's, like, it's unbearable yeah. for summer times. It's like, I remember that three years, three or five years ago, uh, we, we were fasting for 18 hours or 17 hours, you know? We were like, oh, yeah. God help us. As well as not eating or drinking, you're not really supposed to taste anything. And some say you're not even allowed to smell flowers during your fast. All of this is supposed to teach people to be grateful for what they have and to help them understand what those less fortunate than them are going through. Sheda, a student in Kayseri, told me more about the rules she follows during the fast. When you're pregnant, you are not allowed to fast because that will be really uh, bad for the baby. And when the girls are on their periods, then it is also not allowed for them to fast. You can't get some... Uh, Insulin? Insulin. Yes. Yeah. If you're a diabetic. I think so. You can't get that. Nothing can get into your body. And you can't have sex. If you are sick and you vomit while you're fasting, then it's broken so you can eat. Yeah. And also if you have to take pills, if it's very important in the day, then you just take your pills so you're not fasting again. When you're traveling, you don't have to fast that day, but later in the day, for example, uh, after the Ramadan, yeah. one day when you feel clear for it, you just fast that day instead of the day uh, at the Ramadan. Okay. There is a set distance, though. That only applies to travelers who are going further than 90 kilometers from home. I guess that technically meant I was in the clear. But what happens if you keep breaking the rules? then you have to fast 60 days. 60 days? But, then, but you can do it in the, whenever you want, in the winter, but without uh, stopping. And that 60 days doesn't include the 30 during Ramadan. So you're looking at 90 in total. My last stop in Turkey was Rize, on the Black Sea coast. It's a pretty religious and conservative region. Each one of those narrow towers is the minaret of a mosque.
It's famous for being Turkey's tea capital. And it's also the hometown of the current president, Erdogan, and the source of a lively traditional folk dance called Horon. While I was there, I was hosted by some university students, most of whom were fasting. That sound is the ezan, the Islamic call to prayer that's played from mosques five times a day. As it goes on, you can hear what sounds like an echo. But that isn't actually an echo. Because its timing depends on the position of the sun, the ezan is played at slightly different times depending on where you are. That means that in neighbouring villages, they start a few seconds apart, giving the effect of an echo that seems to start on one side of you before coming full circle and surrounding you. In the early hours of the morning, it signals the beginning of the fast, and when you hear it in the evening, that means you can eat again. The ezan just started. That means we can eat food. And if you think you might accidentally sleep through your last chance to eat before the morning ezan, don't worry. There are drummers that walk around town at around 2 a.m. to wake you up so that doesn't happen. Janet, you have a headache? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Bushra, what's your advice for people who want to fast? Be strong. Be strong. That's really great. We win. We win. We will live. <laughs> when you're fasting, yeah. can you swill water in your mouth and then spit it out? Like when you clean your teeth and stuff. Um, brush teeth, only teeth. Um, using no. No toothpaste. Ah, toothpaste, no. Test. Oh, the taste. Test. Uh, toothpaste, food yeah. no. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> we win. <laughs> we win. Two, one. That's it. That is a very welcome sound. It's common for total strangers to sit down and share their food with one another once the evening ezan rings out. Uh, we, are we are going to iftar tent. Filter <laughs> <laughs> park, iftar tent. The iftar tent, where people go at the end of the day during Ramadan to get some food. Many often head to a communal area at sunset, where food is served for free. Anyone is welcome to go to an iftar tent, and when you sit down to eat with hundreds of others at the end of the day, it feels like the entire country is having dinner together. Arriving in Turkey, I'd had no idea I'd spend so much time learning about one of the world's major religious periods. To be honest, I was a bit embarrassed that I'd known so little about Ramadan, given where I was going and when. But I felt lucky to see Turkey at its best. When hundreds of millions of people, here and across the rest of the world, were reflecting on what they should be grateful for, and what life is like for those in need. Being here during the fasting period highlighted the hospitality I'd heard so much about before. Hello man, my last day. 
People dropped off food for their neighbors, shared picnics with one another for iftar, and encouraged me to join in. Their openness and warmth meant I left Turkey feeling like I wasn't so far from home. It was the first time I felt a big twinge of sadness at the prospect of cycling on to another country. Goodbye, Kemal. Goodbye, my England brother. Long live Ottoman Empire. Yeah, see you again. Hope to see you again, yeah. too. <laughs> Bye, man. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Allah. <laughs> it was so nice to meet you guys. But I wouldn't have time to dwell on the goodbyes for long. Because now, it was on to Georgia and the Caucasus. And who knows what was in store for me there.